Hi, my name is Dr. Kirby Runyon, and I'm a planetary geologist. Specifically, I'm a planetary geomorphologist. So that means that I study the geologic forces that shape the current uh, landforms and landscapes on planets and small worlds throughout the solar system. The view of planet that uh, I hold to, the definition that I use in my professional world, uh, comes from a definition that I co-authored with Alan Stern and Mark Sykes and some other people. And it's been uh, published, in, among other places, uh, in this issue of Astronomy Magazine from May 2018, going to page 28. And I'll simply read it. A planet is a substellar mass body that has never undergone nuclear fusion and has enough gravitation to be round due to hydrostatic equilibrium, regardless of its orbital parameters. This is a definition that is consistent with the usage in peer-reviewed planetary science papers, publications, going back from Galileo before the IAU definitional vote in 2006 on what a planet supposedly was or wasn't, past that vote and right up to the present. If you go through the literature and simply look at how planetary scientists use the word planet, they use, we use that word to refer not just to dwarf planets like Pluto, Eris, Makemake, and others, but other round worlds as well, including moons. You'll see multiple times in the literature where moons like Titan or Europa, um, Enceladus, other places like that, instead of saying the name of the world over and over again, Titan, 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 Enceladus, 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 the author will simply say the planet, the planet, the planet. So for example, you might see something like sand dunes encircle the equator of Titan. If one considers the poles of the planet, they'll see that there are lakes of liquid methane and liquid ethane. You see how I use the word planet there to refer to Titan? That sort of thing is all over the place in the scientific literature. So simply based on the precedent by scientific experts, the word planet really means any round world. No one really, no planetary scientists really use the IAU definition of a planet that re restricts the number of planets to eight. In other words, most planet, many or most planetary scientists simply ignore the irrelevant IAU planet definition when using the word planet. It's also worth noting that in science, Carl Sagan once said, there are no authorities. At best, there are experts. So to have a vote means that one is appealing to authority, which is not a scientific concept. So most planetary scientists who were actually not even involved with the IAU's vote on the definition of a planet simply ignore the IAU, undermining the legitimacy and any perceived authority of the IAU. The general public would therefore be well advised to also ignore the IAU planet definition and use the planet definition that most or many planetary scientists use. Now in science we have this idea of scientific freedom. Part of science is taxonomy the classification of objects. Planetary scientists, whether they're planetary astronomers, planetary geologists, or astrobiologists, or planetary geophysicists, or planetary atmospheric scientists, they are free to use scientific taxonomy that's useful to them for describing the objects that they study. Now, for certain planetary scientists, uh, specifically planetary astronomers, a definition of planet very much like the IAU's definition of a planet, where it must have cleared its orbit to be considered a planet, might very well be a useful definition to them. So for instance, my colleague Mike Brown, with whom I disagree on what the definition of a planet is, regards gravitational dominance. In other words, one planet's gravitational ability to fling other worlds around, that's a key criterion for what a planet is. This is Nixie. And to him, that's a useful definition because it has to do with uh, orbits and gravitational dominance in other worlds. Now, he's an astronomer, but I'm a geologist, and many of my colleagues are concerned with the surface and internal properties of worlds. And so Mike Brown's definition of a planet simply is not useful to us, and so we just don't use it. Now, I don't begrudge him and his colleagues uh, that definition of planet if it's useful to them, but I'd also ask the courtesy to be returned that planetary astronomers and others not begrudge planet, other planetary scientists for using a planet definition that's useful to us. Now, a point on which I and many others actually agree with the IAU planet definition 
is on the classification of Pluto and the dozens of other worlds of similar size uh, as dwarf planets. Pretty much everyone agrees that Pluto, Eris, Makemake, Eris, Haumea, Varuna, Ixion, all these small worlds, Quayoar, that they're dwarf planets. The difference is that we just consider dwarf planets to be a subcategory of full-fledged planets. There's already precedent for this. People referred to Jupiter and Saturn as gas giant planets. We refer to Uranus and Neptune as ice giant planets. Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury are all terrestrial planets. And things and planets that are small are just dwarf planets. They're full-fledged planets. We just have to understand that there are actually dozens to hundreds of planets in our solar system alone, and that that does not diminish the usefulness of the word planet. If there are hundreds of planets in our solar system, most of which are dwarf planets, it's instructive to note, nature likes to make more dwarf planets than giant planets or terrestrial planets. That's interesting. That, by using a different definition of planet that's inclusive of dwarf planets, we're able to have that uh, realization that we wouldn't have otherwise if we weren't calling dwarf planets planets. It's also a logical contradiction to say that a dwarf planet is not a planet. The word dwarf is just an adjective to tell us what kind of planet we have. On top of all this, we also consider round moons to be planets. They're just small planets orbiting big planets. Neil Armstrong was the first astronaut to walk on another planet. It's just that it was a planet orbiting our planet. Europa, where we want to send a lander to look for possibly signs of life, is a small planet orbiting Jupiter. It doesn't cease to be a moon. It doesn't cease to be a satellite. Instead, it is a satellite planet. This is just a very broad definition of planet in which there are many subcategories. Back to the idea of authority in science. Because authority in science is an illegitimate concept, the International Astronomical Union's definition of a planet is uh, it's bogus and non-binding. Now, if planetary astronomers want to use, or, or like a subset of planetary astronomers, if they want to use the IAU definition, of gravitational dominance of smaller worlds, that's fine. They have the scientific freedom to do that, just as we have the scientific freedom to use another planet definition. But they should not look to the IAU to cement their preferred planet definition. They should just use the definition they want in their teaching and in their publications and in their research, just as we do. We certainly don't look to the IAU for anything. And accordingly, we're not necessarily looking for the IAU to overturn its planet definition because we don't recognize their authority to do so in the first place. Again, because authority in scientific taxonomy is a false concept. If the IAU should do anything at all, they should simply rescind their planetary definition without replacing it. That would send the message to the public that it is the scientists themselves, and in a grassroots sort of sense, who use scientific definitions that are useful to them, and that the precedent set by these scientists is what is key in defining definitions. A take-home message for the media and educators is to ignore the IAU definition and to instead use the precedent by many of us planetary scientists in the literature who use the word planet to refer to any round world. My colleague, Phil Metzger, who has been instrumental in working with Alan Stern, Mark Sykes, and myself and some others on the geophysical definition of a planet that is already cemented in the literature. Uh, Phil has written uh, a paper in the journal Icarus, which is a preeminent planetary science journal, chronicling the use of the word planet and asteroid actually throughout history. It can be demonstrated through a rigorous literature search from Galileo up to the present that Phil did that asteroids were not demoted to non-planets by largely being concentrated in the asteroid belt and therefore sharing orbits with each other and therefore not clearing their own orbits. Remember, the IAU planet definition says that a planet must have cleared its orbit, which itself is a poorly defined term. If you go to the IAU's planet definition website, it actually says, it actually claims that this decision by the IAU was based on the historical precedent supposedly set with the demotion of uh, asteroids from planets to non-planets because of orbit sharing. That is a false historical claim. History does not bear that out. That IAU claim is anachronistic. Asteroids did not lose their planetary status in the 1950s. In fact, there was a paper in 1953 by Gerard Kuiper who talked about asteroids as being separate from planets. Subsequently, in 1957, no one referred to asteroids as planets anymore. 
That decision in the literature was precipitated by a recognition that they were geophysically distinct from planets. They were different on the inside. Their formation was different. It started to become clear that they probably weren't round. This further uh, cements the legitimacy and the historical precedent of using intrinsic geophysical properties to define planethood and not the orbit, contrary to the definition of the IAU. So not only does the IAU definition violate scientific integrity and, and usefulness and precedent on so many levels, it also uses a false historical claim probably based on just urban legend. People got used to repeating the phrase, asteroids were demoted from planets to non-planets because they all share orbits in the asteroid belt. Something similar to that. So again, this is a paper uh, published by Phil Metzger um, and myself and Alan Stern and Mark Sykes uh, published in the journal Icarus that showed uh, from a scientific literature perspective that asteroids were demoted from planets to non-planets based on their intrinsic geophysical properties and not on their extrinsic orbital properties. And this completely undermines the IAU planet criterion that a planet must have cleared its orbit around the sun. So again, to summarize at this point, many planetary scientists ignore the IAU definition, and the general public and the media should likewise feel free to follow that precedent. Dwarf planets are planets too, and in its science, we don't have authorities, we have experts. One final comment on the International Astronomical Union's definition of a planet that they voted on in 2006. And that is that almost no planetary scientists were involved with that vote. So the situation you have then is that astronomers who don't study planets violated scientific convention by voting and trying to establish some authority to then tell scientists of another discipline, namely planetary scientists, what it is they study. This would be like a heart doctor, a cardiologist, telling an orthopedic surgeon, a bone doctor, what a bone is or what a vertebrae is. It's like, no, stick to your own discipline and don't tell other scientists what it is that they can study. As a fun side note, I recently ran into Mike Brown at Caltech and he's a nice enough, amiable guy. We've only ever had good interactions with each other. Uh, but he was kind enough to autograph my copy of his book, How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. Kirby, sorry about killing Pluto. Haha, ha, just kidding. It totally had it coming. Mike Brown. Now, the problem is that he published this book in 2012, three years before the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto to give us our first up-close pictures of that planet. And rather than being dead, Pluto is alive. It has a heart-shaped region on it that is literally pulsing with the life of geology. There's a nitrogen ice glacier that is actively convecting and processing material. So far from being dead, Pluto is very much alive. Now the geologic processes on Pluto, for instance, are vast. Pluto had or has a subsurface liquid water ocean that has been freezing slowly since Pluto formed. And that's led to what we call extensional tectonics on the surface of Pluto, leading to faulting and canyons and what are called grobbins, down drop blocks of crust bounded by two normal faults. There's tons of sublimation driven geology. Nitrogen and methane sublimate into a gas. They then subsequently refreeze and get distributed across the surface of the planet. Ah, see how I use the word planet there? forming glacially carved valleys of, ne of interconnecting networks. There's impact cratering. That's um, an exogenic geologic process. Pluto is certainly differentiated. Uh, rockier material is towards the core, we think, and, and lighter, icier material is towards the, the, the surface. Pluto and Charon actually form a double planet. They actually orbit around each other. So even in the IAU definition of a planet, they both directly orbit the sun. And even the IAU is being inconsistent because they don't even recognize Charon as a dwarf planet. And Charon certainly is both a dwarf planet and a satellite planet. Actually, you could call Pluto a satellite planet as well, even though uh, the um, gravitational equilibrium point, what's called the barycenter, is closer to Pluto than it is to Charon as uh, they orbit around a common point in space. This geologic activity on Pluto underscores the planethood, the importance of geophysical processes that help to define planethood. Again, my name is Dr. Kirby Runyon. Thanks for your interest.